Welcome to another episode of the .NET Doc Show. This is 60 Minutes of Unscripted .NET Madness. Uh, I'm your host, Scott Addy, and with me today is co-host, uh, Cam Soper. Joining us, and I hope I pronounce this correctly, is our guest, Johnny Hoybers. Perfect. He had said before the show, if I butcher it, I could call him Johnny Haystack. I was... So. You did a good job. Perfect. Yeah. So it sounds like today we're going to talk about uh, the hot new bits that dropped last week in the .NET 6 release. Um, before we get into that, I would like to roll into the checkup segment. Uh, why don't you hit me with that, Cam? All right. I'm going to pull up the checkup for today. It is actually our... Um, you can hide that banner, Cam. That that one never was updated. Oh, cool. Sorry, Scott. There you go. All right. So what we've got is if you've followed along with the, the .NET documentation out on docs.microsoft.com, you would be used to seeing these what's new in .NET uh, docs that we publish. Not me personally, but the team. We've got this new what's new in .NET 6 um, doc that shipped uh, just a few days ago, actually. That's when it was content complete. I'd like to just draw attention to a few things in here. We could talk about this for hours, but I'd like to point out that uh, the .NET 6 release ships with uh, support for C Sharp 10. Um, skip over to that section. Some of the new exciting things that you'll notice as a result of C Sharp 10 support being there is updated project templates. Uh, things like top level statements, target type new expressions, uh, implicit global using directives, file scope namespaces, and nullable reference types are enabled by default in those project templates. The things I've listed here, not all of those are new in C Sharp 10. However, uh, these are things that are enabled um, out of the box, uh, typically. So Scott, I'm, I'm wondering, has, uh, have you done much with .NET 6 so far? Uh, I, a little bit. I'm sure you've done more than I have, Cam. So, so where where I, I have found that some of these template changes took a little getting used to, like the implicit uh, global using directives and the nullable reference types. I'm still not quite used to those. Um, I have to I have to think through uh, what I'm doing there uh, quite a bit yeah. more than I used to. It, it, so we talked about this a few weeks back. We had a guest on talking about minimal APIs in .NET 6. I think that's been the biggest uh, shift for folks in the community is trying to adapt to that new approach. The good news is there is a way for the in the project templates within VS to opt out of that and revert to the old style of project template. For things like minimal APIs, if you'd prefer to have controllers instead, you can, again, revert back. The other thing I'll point out in this doc, because I've been uh, looking at this myself in my day job, is the uh, new um, open telemetry support that you'll see in the ASP.NET Core workload. So if we skip down to the ASP.NET Core section, you can read a little bit about what's going on here. Uh, the reason why I point out open telemetry, uh, shameless plug time, if I go over to the Azure SDK for .NET blog, you will see that our friend Pavel has written all about this experimental support that's been added um, in the Azure SDK for .NET, specifically for open telemetry, which I'll call OTEL for short. So if you followed uh, you know, this observability trend, uh, you know that there's the three pillars. You've got logging, metrics, and uh, tracing. Uh, OTEL fits that distributed tracing bill very nicely. So again, if this uh, OTEL support is something you're interested in, we've got you covered not only in the um, ASP.NET Core workload in .NET 6, but we've also got experimental support over in the Azure SDK for .NET. Again, if you wanted to find this, uh, this doc, uh, we don't have an ACA link for you, unfortunately, today. Uh, you could find this out at docs.microsoft.com, and I will post this link in the chat for folks who are interested in, in reading more. Um, with that, why don't we uh, kick it over to the hallway track and, and hear from our guest. Cool. 
Cool. So welcome again to the show, Johnny. We're super stoked to have you on the show today. <laughs> Very um, happy to be here. And thank you. Uh, and again, as I mentioned earlier, I, I refuse to call you Johnny Haystack. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yet you so, still do. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about, about all what is .NET, um, because basically I've been, I've been doing .NET since its early beginnings, and I'm, I'm still a huge fan, fan today. There's lots of history there, um, lots to talk about. And because I'm, I'm such a, a .NET geek, let's say, uh, I do lots, lots of uh, fun things in my, in my free time. I create little applications to run at home, and I want to show some of them, and, and I want to show one specifically, which I've upgraded to .NET 6 um, in the, the past few weeks. And I want to talk about what the upgrade actually did. So what did I change? What do I, what do I think are good things in .NET 6? Where are, I am still maybe a little bit confused about? Uh, and yeah, that's it. Um, that all sounds amazing. I, I think the, the upgrade path in particular will interest a lot of people. Um, yep. So great. Where do we start in that conversation? What would you like to Well, maybe I, I can start a little bit about my history first, um, because I I was all I was always uh, quite interested in in programming. I think I just wanted to create things when I was a little kid, but I was too lazy to do it like physically, so I just sat behind a computer and tried to try to create stuff stuff that way. Um and actually when I when I was in my final year of of um of high school, I think I think it's called in the United States. So my the 12th grade, uh, we we had to do like a final project. Uh, and I, I, one of my best friends and me, we did a project together. And I, we were doing some programming back in, in, in those days when I was uh, 17 years old. Uh, and we were using C++ because that was, for me, the, the only way to create Windows applications in that time. I, I, I didn't know anything else. And, and it's, it's really geeky and really fun. But uh, we were actually exchanging CDs with Visual Studio uh, on the on the on the playground of the school, like illegal versions of Visual Studio, just to to play around with. So I was already into Visual Studio six. It was it was then, um, and then yeah, I was I was getting sick and tired of, of, of C plus plus because my final project and and actually I I found it today. It's it's this. It's just uh, it's just uh, I, I if uh, if you show my screen. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It's um, it's a very very silly application that just uh, shows like uh, mathematical functions. So you can do ax squared plus bx plus c, for example. Uh, you can change the color, um, and then you can draw that. And then by using your keyboard, a, b's, and c's, you can change these things. So I, I was I was doing this kind of stuff, and it was very 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 difficult to do that in C plus plus and MFC. Uh, and I wanted to do something easier. So I was really looking out for another programming language that would help me create these things much easier or much faster. And I was looking at Delphi. Um, and I was just about to get on the Delphi boat when .NET released in 2001, 2002. So uh, I'm still today, I'm very happy that I took that decision and, and, and jumped to .NET because I'm not really sure if Delphi is, 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 is still a popular thing uh, today. Uh, yeah, so let's let's get rid of that. Yeah, I you know, I personally I haven't heard of Delphi in at least a few years. I don't know about you, Cam, but that that reminds. Did we? I, I think we lost Scott. Yeah, I don't know what it reminds him of, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, Delphi. I have never actually touched Delphi, but I remember it was like the big VB six competitor way back yeah, when, yeah. right? Exactly. So uh, we did, I, you know, while we're waiting for Scott to reconnect, uh, we did have a, a comment that I want to address. Someone said minimal API in a .NET 6 creates more confusion, right? And I, I will tell you that I kind of agree with you, um, uh, viewer. I'm sorry, I'm not going to try to pronounce your name. I don't want to. I don't want to get it wrong. Um, but the uh, uh, Remember, you don't have to use minimal API. You can use controllers. Controllers are still yep. there. They're still supported. Minimal API is just another way of doing it. It's like MVC versus Razor. MVC and Razor live side by side happily, and, and minimal API and controller-based API, uh, those sit there happily side by side too. Um, sorry for that digression. Hey, I think Scott's coming back to the stream. Um, he's, well, maybe, maybe. 
I'm sorry. Go ahead, Johnny. Please continue telling us about your. <laughs> no, and uh, by the way, it's a very good question and a very good statement about uh, the minimal APIs. Um, I, I will discuss uh, about this in uh, in a couple of minutes, um, and and I think the reason that this question is asked is is I also have been teaching uh, uh, .NET and, and C Sharp for for ten years uh, mm -hmm. in in night school, uh, and I could also see this during the years for people just learning .NET things became more difficult and more difficult because .NET is becoming so wide today. There's so many things you can create in so many different ways. So when you're just starting out .NET, you have so many options. When I started .NET, there were only a few options. You could basically create a web forms application in ASP.NET Web Forms, you could create a, a WinForms application or a console application. And that were almost all of the options you had. So I was lucky to to grow with .NET. Uh, when .NET released something new, I learned the something new. But if you, if you do .NET today, of course, you have a wide range of things that you can do and you can choose. But of course, it's, it's a little bit up to you which decisions you make. And that can be quite confusing. Um, but uh, yeah, let's let's get into uh, a little bit of .NET 6. So uh, a little bit of background. I told you I was doing some teaching. Uh, actually, I stopped teaching uh, when when uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic happened. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to do it again because I was doing this in my free time at night after my, my working hours. Um, but I was kind of sick teaching my students C Sharp by just doing console applications because a console application is boring. Um, so I, I decided to create a, a kind of a little game where students could program simple C sharp code to actually uh, make a robot fight in an arena. So I, I decided to challenge myself with a little bit of Unity. I never did Unity uh, before and, and I never did since. Um, but I created like a 3D arena, which is just like a board with squares. And on this board, you could put um, you could put a robot. And that robot needs to do something and it needs to make decisions based on the, the what's happening on the arena. And this can be done by doing some C sharp. So basically, uh, when I tell my students this and I teach them about how to declare a variable, how to make a decision based on an if structure, uh, stuff like that, they can immediately see the result because they, their robot will, will walk around. Um, and that's basically what I call C sharp wars. Um, so I created a, a very simple uh, ASP.NET MVC uh, web application because I'm not very good in UI and front end. I mostly do back end. So that's why it looks this generic MVC stuff. Um, but if you log in, you can create what I call a robot script. And a robot script is just a piece of C-sharp code. There's no methods, there's no classes, there's no namespaces, just code. And this is a very simple example script that actually um, declares a variable called step. It loads from This is the show where we have all the connection so, issues. Yeah. So I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Johnny. You cut out for a little bit. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. Probably my my display driver is crashing. Can you still hear me? Yes. Yep. You're back. Yep. Okay. So yeah, and and so this robot basically walks around in circles. Um, so it uh, it takes two steps forwards, and on the third step it turns left, and then two steps forward it turns left, and so on. So it's a ninety degree turn. Um, so if I use this script, I can click this button, play the script from the template, which is taking a very long time. Okay, I'm just while I wait, I'm just going to discuss a little bit further. So you can you can deploy deploy a script like this. So so Johnny, I don't know. Yeah. So we were talking before the show about your CPU temperatures and your CPU temperatures have all gone up by about 20 degrees. Yeah, I can see that. Um, I'll um, I'll just deploy some some template script instead of writing it myself. There we go. And if I go back here, the robot should appear and should do whatever it's programmed to do. So yeah, this is a, just a, a little backstory. On, on what I did to make my students' life a little bit more fun. Um, and this is a project that I did many years ago. 
and I've actually upgraded it just uh, last week to, to .NET 6 to see what happens and, and, and what is new in .NET 6. And that's what I wanted to talk about. Uh, now, before you dig into that, I have a question. Which, my, or which version of .NET did you migrate to or f from to, to .NET? Um, .NET Core 3.1. And bef okay. bef before that, I did the migration from .NET Framework to- Okay, so you would have been migrating point. from what was the latest LTS release of .NET. Now the yes. latest is yes. uh, .NET 6. Yes, indeed, that's correct. So let's go to Visual Studio. So what I what I did first, um, let me let me maybe first explain the the, the project structure here. Um, the the C sharp wars application is is made out of different components. I think it has like a distributed application. Um, there's there's a web API. It's just an API, and and it's 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 not a very high tech game. Basically, the Unity front end will call the API every two seconds asking what is the current game state and then the api will just return this so it's not re a real time thing it's just like a, a polling mechanism where unity just asks every two seconds give me the current game state and then it will render that that game state every two seconds so that's why i need the api um, then the the web ui is of course the thing that we saw the things that students can use to write and deploy their code to the arena then there's the processing middleware which is a a worker service and in the in the past this was a windows service so with the migration from .NET frame, framework to .NET uh, core and .NET 6 i um, made it into a worker service and this is basically a, a long running service that continuously takes all the scripts from the from the players or the students um, it compiles those scripts it checks if if there's any errors or runtime errors even um, and then it it runs those scripts every two seconds and it stores the the, the updated game states in a in a database and then finally because um, students make many mistakes I have a separate service which is called a validator which is a grpc service um, and when you deploy a script it's not immediately sent to a database it first goes through the validator uh, via uh, gRPC um, to check if, if there's any mistakes or infinite loops, because when people make an infinite loop in their code, I compile and run their code. I'm just um, in a problem. My, my processor is, is running infinite code, which is not a good idea. So the validated is, is, is actually a service that notices this. And when it runs longer than a certain amount of time, it will reject that script uh, and, the, and the student needs to, to to make, a, to make a, some modifications there. And the reason it's a separate process also is because when you deploy this into like a containerized environment or an Azure Kubernetes uh, thing, you can just monitor that service. Is it, if it's running too, too much code, if it's uh, having too, too much memory usage or too, too much CPU usage, you can just kill it, spin up a new container and it, it, the whole thing just keeps running, which is very nice. So yeah, that's, that's the, the basic architecture and the and the project structure of this C sharp wars thing and yeah the first thing that I did was just go into the project files and change the target framework from uh, .NET uh, 3.1 or .NET Core 3.1 to .NET 6 and if I remember correctly I did not have to do any modifications I just so, only did so, so you skipped five you went from from L from the LTS 3.1 yes, to LTS yes. 6.0 yeah cool yeah indeed um I, I i did a number of other projects in dotnet 5 and just hadn't had the time to to upgrade this to 5 so i just skipped 5 and, and went to 6 uh, immediately um yeah and that was my first step i i thought i would have more things that i needed to fix um i just deployed uh, the whole solution again and it it just ran perfectly fine so i was like okay this upgrade was good but i didn't have a lot of fun with it <laughs> so that's that's when i decided to manually upgrade also all of the, the new things that are in the new templates. I, Scott, you, you already talked about this, like the nullable and the yep. implicit using st uh, stuff. So I just added those things manually because of course the, the, the projects are already there. But when you do file new project in Visual Studio for .NET 6, there's new templates and they will enable this stuff for you automatically. Just, yeah. like, Scott, just like Scott said before, you can disable them if you don't want them by just removing these, uh, these um, properties from your project file. Well, something I'd like to point out here, so nullable reference types, which you've enabled here in your project file, they've been yeah. around since C-sharp 8. 
you know, we're, we're now on C-sharp 10. So this is not a new feature. My Correct. question here is when you enabled nullable reference types in this project, how much pain did that really cause you? Was it an easy thing to, to deal with? Um, for me, probably not easy um, because I didn't really deal with it yet, um, to be honest. Uh, you, you also said before that, that it is a, it is something completely different. If you're not used to nullable reference types, there's a lot of, of, of learning that you need to do. And for me, it's the same thing. I never enabled nullable reference types. I knew I knew it existed. I knew it was there, but I just didn't have the time to, to, to dig a little bit deeper. But now when you do file new project, you are basically forced to use it or not, not forced, you can disable it, but you are encouraged to use it. I, I had that exact same experience. Um, I'm, I'm working on some uh, content around entity framework and uh, the, the entity classes in entity framework, um, you know, exist as null in, in within the entity framework pipeline various times. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, I had a lot of compiler warnings that I had to, had to go back and put the, uh, the so-called damn it operator in. <laughs> yeah, uh, and it's actually, it's, a, it's good that you point that out because I think that I um, disabled it for my model, for my entity framework model. So here I don't have nullable reference type enabled because this of course um, makes a change to your database structure. Um, and so I disabled it again and I really want to look into that. Um, I need to use the nullable operator, but I did not have time to do that yet. So indeed, this is the only project where I disabled um, the, the nullable reference type for now, but I will re-enable it after I made some modifications to my to my models. Um, so for now, I just have a lot of warnings. If I do a comp compilation, I'm not sure if I did, but if I do a compilation, I have uh, many warnings that say, okay, this can be null, so you need to, to use the nullable reference type. So I did not yet go through my code. So that will be a lot of work for me. But I'm I'm actually I'm happy that they that they are um, encouraging me to use nullable reference types because I want to I want to do that I want to learn how to use that because I think it's a good idea. I do worry a little bit, and and maybe maybe you might have a, an opinion on this as as a as a teacher. I, I worry that that complicates learning C sharp, right? I mean, I, I feel like we keep adding all of these language features that that clearly serve a very valuable purpose like nullable reference types, but add another layer of complication to, to new developers. And I, I don't know, I don't know whether or not to leave those things in place. If you're teaching somebody, you know, from, you know, like a greenfield uh, instructional point of view or, um, or, or to dumb it down for them. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. And actually, that is something that I've been struggling with these last few versions of C-sharp and, and, and .NET. Um, what, is, yeah, what is a good idea for, for people just starting out? Um, I, have this, I have the same thing with, um, with like the console applications. I, I mean, all of the templates now, but it, it started with console applications where you don't need the namespace, you don't need the class, uh, the, the program class, and then the main method. So I like it for like teaching students the basics. That's basically why I created the game that I'm, I was talking about. You don't need all of this stuff to explain how to declare a variable. But then again, you hide a lot of the complexity. Um, and when you dumb it down like that, um, and then the complexity comes up in another scenario, people maybe don't really know what, the, what they're doing. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a very good question. And I, I myself am, am still struggling with that. What should I learn? How should I teach? You know, I would, I would bring up a recent conversation I had with a mentor here at Microsoft. And um, when he first said this, I about fell out of my chair, but he, what, he, what he had said to me was, Scott, you know, I like all the new features they're adding to C-sharp. You know, they have their place, but they're not for me. I have apps running in production. They have been for years, and they're running on C-sharp 3. C-sharp 3 shipped with Visual Studio 2008. The point here is, you know, the, these features aren't for everybody. It's okay to not be on the latest and greatest. Uh, you know, use the, the language features you need to get the job done. Um, it's... It, you know, we're really not going after when we're writing, we're paid to write um, code to solve problems. We're not paid to use the latest and greatest language features. Yeah, that's correct. So use the code that solves the problem and ultimately puts food on the table for your family. Yeah, 
Indeed. Yeah, and then for me, there's a big difference between this, this kinds of projects um, I use for personal learning and, and to do fun stuff at home. Um, and then when I work for customers, it's it's basically whatever the customer is doing. Uh, I'm a consultant. I work for, for a customer right now that is still doing .NET Framework, and I'm fine with that. It works, um, and it doesn't need to be upgraded right now. It will be upgraded eventually, but you don't really have to use the latest features all the time. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, are there more elegant ways to do things than there were in C Sharp 3? Yes. Yes, do but there's always more yeah. elegant things. There's always yeah. more elegant ways. And you can keep on refactoring your code to be more elegant, but at a certain point, it doesn't really help you. Yep. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And yeah, if you look at these minimal APIs, it's the, it's the exact same thing. I'm also struggling for myself. Am I, am I still going to use controllers or am, am I always going to use minimal APIs? Um, very good question. I'm still not uh, entirely sure. Um, for this for this specific project, I decided to try the, the minimal APIs and, and see how I can work with them. But this is, of course, an easy um, project. It's not a project that has 1 million endpoints, um, which is an exaggeration, of course. Um, but for this specific use case, I like it because my web API has like three classes. It has like a program class, um, which is like the, the new way, the new template of creating uh, ASP.NET. So you don't have this startup class anymore. You just put everything in this top level program. Um, and then in the end, instead of putting all of your endpoints in controllers, you just list them up um, on your uh, web application. So I, I map a get operation on my web application for the route uh, slash arena, slash uh, robot, slash players, slash messages, and so on. But I only have three, six, seven, eight endpoints. So in this case, I think it's a good it's a good idea. It's it's very it's very concise. I can immediately see all of my endpoints, and that's that's perfectly fine. But if you have hundreds of endpoints, maybe it's a better idea to just keep using the controllers or have some some other thing that you maybe invent invent yourself to, to, to do this. Um, because the, the story that I always told my students uh, in the past is also a web API for me. It's a technology. It's not really a part of your business logic. So I always encourage them to put as to put um, not not a lot of logic inside of their controllers. Basically, their controllers mm -hmm. should call their business logic. And you can use yeah. all kinds of frameworks to do that, uh, um, like Mediator, for example. So basically, when you when you throw away your, your web API, and you want to do like gRPC or something, you have not a lot of work because your business logic is separated and you can just use the new technology and call the same methods that you already created. And that's also why I created this API helper here. I didn't want to have all the logic that uh, that that um, that regulates the the HTTP status codes. I don't want to do that here, so that's why I, I created the API helper class. This is of course for just a personal project, so so I wrote it very quickly. But it has like a method that takes an ex an expression of func, um, which is just a, a lambda expression um, that calls a logic function on a logic class or so business logic function. So mm -hmm. this API helper is a generic class that takes some kind of business logic um, uh, type parameter. And based on that, you can use a lambda expression to call your um, business logic. And then in the actual implementation, there is stuff like memory cache uh, and, and HTTP HTTP results based on whatever is happening. So I only re re need to write this logic one once in a generic way, and I can very easily in my in my uh, minimal API tell this thing. Okay, if you call the arena endpoint, just execute the get arena on the i arena logic business logic now, class. And now where this, where does that? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but where does that get arena method come from? So the i arena logic. Is an um, is an interface on my business logic, which mm -hmm. is uh, let me find Looks it. Like my my... project five there. Yeah. So here I have all my business logic classes, and they have the interface and then the implementation. So the interface is right here. I arena logic. It has probably only the one method get arena, and then here's the implementation. It uses a configuration helper and then it does get arena. 
uh, that's implementation. And then the API helper is generic in a way that it takes a generic type parameter, which should be the, the interface. And then when you look at the implementation for the API helper, it actually um, uses dependency injection to ask for or to inject um, that uh, that implementation for that interface. So you don't need to do it by hand. It automatically um, comes with that API helper. So if you create an a API helper of I arena logic, then it will create an instance of API helper and it will inject um, the instance for the uh, arena uh, logic. And that's also so the reason. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Did, did you come up with this pattern or, or did you borrow this from somebody? Because this is, I like this pattern. This is very nice. Yeah, I, I, I created it many years ago for myself um, when I was doing APIs. I was doing so many APIs for so many different customers um, that I decided, okay, I'm always doing the same thing. I'm always doing the HTTP status code. Sometimes they, they want to do some additional logging or they want to do some, some uh, Azure Redis cache stuff. So I created this kind of, of, of way and I always created for myself again and again and again. Actually, I should make a NuGet package out of it that, that it's a little bit more uh, advanced than this. Um, because I'm actually always doing the same thing. Yeah, I, I would use that NuGet package. Yeah, and I I, I really like the, the those concepts of, of Lambda expressions because you also have IntelliSense. So when 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 you're using this, you can just when you execute this, you just do L dot, and it gives you an IntelliSense on what what all the methods are that you can use. Um, so yeah, I'm a I'm a fan of this. Our friend uh, Fuel Snable in the chat uh, referenced using T4 templates in a case like this. Uh, is that something you've explored, or maybe no, uh, no? I know, yeah, I know what they are. Uh, I know that you can uh, like code, code generation using T4 uh, templates, but I've never tried that uh, myself. Cool. Did you? Um, I I have used T4 uh, for th typically with projects that use Entity Framework, uh, but it's been years since I've taken that approach. I've since moved away from it. I just yep. found them clumsy to work with. Um, but again, my personal opinion. Everybody hates. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this was this was uh, one of my. It, it also grew when I was uh, last week when I was changing the, the controllers to this minimal API stuff. I was trying different approaches and then I finally came up with this um, approach because in the past I just created like a base controller for my uh, API controllers. And then that base controller would, would do all of the stuff that you could see in the API helper here. And here I decided to just uh, create an API helper class. But yeah, for small projects, I, I really like this because the project is small. There's only a couple of classes there and in, you, you can just see in one view all of your endpoints. Before, before these were like a, a couple of controllers, like five, six controllers with just a few lines of code, which is not really necessary. So in this case, I like it. But if you have many, many, many more endpoints, I would maybe go back to uh, two controllers by using controllers. And that's the thing. In the current.net, you have the option to do, mm -hmm. to use various different approaches. So we're, we're interacting with, with our, our viewer, Fuel Snable. He, he has gone on to say that T4 is like a giant with an ear infection. <laughs> very powerful and very clumsy. <laughs> nice. The, the imagery in my head is just crazy right now. So in the beginning of the show, we were talking about, I think it was running around the playground with uh, CDs. And I was imagining, you know, uh, running around in the playground at recess, possibly with a backpack full of uh, CDs I had burned with copies of Visual Studio and what was it, the 25-digit product keys written yeah. on them with yeah. a Sharpie. Mm -hmm. And the twenty, I, the twenty million, the twenty million discs containing the the MSDN library for documentation. Oh yes, oh yes. So, um, so, so you have your your C sharp uh, wars, you know, battle bots app here, which, by the way, I think is a, a brilliant way to to teach C sharp. Are there any strategies that work out better versus you know, like if if you or I were if you and I were to come and play C sharp wars? Are you are you just gonna just gonna kick my butt like right out of the gate because you know all the all the tricks and, and tips? Um, it, yeah, it depends. Uh, it depends how 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 intelligent you are, I guess. Uh, of course, I I already created 
many scripts and and i didn't i didn't use like any artificial intelligence stuff or i just wrote simple decisions um so probably i i would i would kill you quite quite easily because i have i have the experience um but it is it is fun because i i did it with students but i'm also using this for like company team building events if you have a company with a group of developers um just let them play this game and it doesn't really matter if you're a student or a developer um it's it's still difficult to create a, a robot that is really intelligent than to mm -hmm. because there's so many different ways you can react in different situations um so it is hard so i i I could see that if, if I give a developer like four hours, they could create something that works, but not not very impressive. If you give them the whole day, like after the first four hours, then they really know how it's working, and then they will they they will create cool things. They will create cool cool things. It is of course also hard for for really smart developers um, because they always try to use reflection to go into my code and try to to, to uh, change things from my code and then try to to uh, make sure that they can control other robots that aren't theirs. Nobody has succeeded in that, but I think it, should, it is pro probably possible. Excellent. But it's, 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 it's a lot of trial and error. Is there, so, so you've got the bits posted somewhere. Is there any, are, are there any public URLs where, where people can, can try this for yeah. themselves or, or, or is your, is your intention for people to download the code and run it locally? Yeah, it's that's that's my my intention indeed to download the code and and, and run it locally. So I have a, a GitHub page. I'm trying to open it. Yep, there it is. Um, so it's it's Johnny, which is my, which is my nickname um, on GitHub, and it has an about me page where where I talk a little bit about myself and all my projects. Um, and here, it is listed somewhere. Oops. So there we go. C sharp wars. Ah, gotcha. Yeah. So yeah. Um, this, this is everyone can download it. I really don't care what you do with it. Um, you can learn from it. You can try to to run it yourself. It's not so so hard to to actually run. You can run it locally. It uses uh, mostly environment variables to do configuration. Um, and it's explained in that uh, in that repository. Uh, I, I deployed it locally in my home on my Synology NAS just as a proof of concept because I can it can run Docker containers, so it runs it perfectly fine. And th the thing that I was showing you is actually running on my Synology NAS, um, but I can also deploy it to Azure Kubernetes service, um, and it runs there also. Excellent. So was there anything else you wanted to show us on C Sharp Wars? I know you also wanted to talk about your sauna project, which also sounds interesting to me. Everyone knows I'm an IoT nerd. And, <laughs> uh, and uh, if, you can, if you can wire something up, I want to wire it up. And it sounds like you wired up your sauna. Yes, I did. So um, yeah, as I told you before, I, when I'm in my free time, I try to play around with, with .NET as much as I can. Uh, and, and my wife is not like it. it, it a tech geek, but she appreciates what I'm doing. Um, so I'm very, very uh, fortunate with that. So when I told her um, when we had the sauna, I, I said, like, okay, this this doesn't look very nice. It was a very old school display. The sauna is actually in the in the in the backyard, uh, back garden, um, and we live in a what we call in Europe a bel etage. So we live on the first floor and not not on the ground floor. So it was a a tedious process to go out and look at the temperature, what's the, the, the current state of the sauna over and over again until it was finished. So I told her, I can I can do a better job. I can make an application and we can just do it remote from 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 within the living room. I, we can see the temperature, we can make changes to the to the sauna, stuff like that. And she was, okay, have fun. And I did it. So that's my <laughs> my sauna project. So, so you, you know, I, I could tell that exact same story about eight different times. <laughs> That's the, it's always the, yeah. the it's always the wife who blesses the project, and and she's always <laughs> the one who 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 evaluates it because you you you've got to engineer for that that uh, it's a term I first heard from Scott Hanselman, but I've heard it many times since then. The the WAF wife acceptance factor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, indeed, indeed. And she she asks me for for other stuff also. Uh, she. Uh, a small time ago she she asked me to have like 
you can buy these giant TVs you can just put on your wall. It doesn't act like a TV, but it's like a, like a digital uh, painting. And she asked, can you, can you do something like an, an app that shows our photos? And, and then we can have an app on the phone when it shows a specific photo that we, on the, on the phone, I can say, I don't like this photo and then it will never show up again, stuff like that. So I'm, I'm building that right now. Um, but the, the sauna project is finished. So uh, this is an image of, of, of when we bought our sauna. So it's, it sits outside a very small garden. Um, and I see you've had dot not bot over to visit. Yeah, indeed. So he, he visited and he approved the project. So I'm very happy with that. Um, and this was actually on the left hand side, you can see the, the, the original display. It's, it's a very huge buttons and then like a segmented LCD display. I was like, when we bought this, it was 2019, 2020. I was like, do they still make these things? Why isn't the display bigger? And, and why is it so huge? And the display is only like two lines of, of segmented LCD display. And yeah, before I, 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 I went into developing the, the application, I looked into the electronics box that was sitting inside of the house. Because if you see, the sauna is built against uh, the wall of the house. And then that electronic box sits inside of the house at the other side of that wall. Um, the wiring looks very awful. So that's the guys in, installed the sauna and this is what it, what it looks like. Uh, and I could see in those those yellow um, circles, those are just relays, like big relays. And they turn on the heating and turn off the heating. They are powered by, um, in, in Europe, 2020 volts. Uh, if you put 2020 volts, 220 volts on those relays, they will open um, and, and the, the heating will start. And then when you um, take away that voltage, uh, the heating will stop. So it's very easy. The reason there's two relays is because we have like a, a Finnish sauna where you have the rocks and you pour water over the rocks. So that's the big relay. It's, a, um, it's like a, a multi-phase. I don't know how you how you say that in English. It's not two-phase, but three-phase. And then the, mm -hmm. the other one, the smaller one, that's for our infrared panels. So it also has built-in infrared panels in the walls. Um, so you can choose to go for infrared sauna or for uh, the finished sauna. And then on the top in the blue circle, there's these little wires coming in, and those are for the temperature sensor. Um, so the temperature sensor sits inside of the sauna. It hangs from the ceiling and it, it measures the temperature. And I was just doing some, some experimentation with that. Okay, how can I control these things from a Raspberry Pi? And when I was able to control those things and read those things from a Raspberry Pi by just looking up the serial numbers from those, uh, like from the, the temperature sensor, it was actually very easy to read that from a, from a Raspberry Pi. I did decided to just paste an Android tablet on top of the original screen. So if I go back to that previous image, you can see that I just taped um, like these. Uh, how do you call that in English? It's uh, um, that just looks like like the Velcro. The, the, Velcro, yeah, yeah the Velcro. Hook, hook and loop fastener, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's Velcro. So I just put like Velcro Velcro strips at the end of the tablet, and then just paste it over it, and now it looks very very clean, very nice. Um, and I have the same application running on my phone. So when I'm in the house, I can just watch the same thing from my phone. And we, when we are in the sauna, now we have a nice large screen that shows a large current temperature, the remaining time, even a graph um, that shows like the, the temperature rising. This is, a, this is just a demo. It's not the actual thing. And then in the top, the current date and time and stuff like that. So yeah, we use this multiple times a week and I'm very happy that I did it. When we go for a walk, we, we take the car, we go for a long walk. When we go, come back to the car, we still need a half an hour drive to go back home. We just take the tablet or we take the phone and we just put on the sauna. And when we get home, the sauna is warm. We can just go in. It's very, very cool. So um, 106 Celsius, are, 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 you, are you boiling somebody? Yeah, Pam, I, just, I was just gonna say this is your new challenge: sous vide in the sauna. <laughs> 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 yeah, the, the the thing is, I'm a I'm a tall guy. Um, I'm two meters tall, so that's uh, I think it's about six seven. Um, so we asked for a large sauna, so I can stand up and I can lie completely flat. Um, but we don't have a lot of power at home for for electricity. Um, so basically, when when this when the temperature sensor says 106 degrees, it's 106 degrees in at the ceiling. 
so it's not really 106 degrees when you're sitting down on the bench. Um, so yeah, it's it's not entirely correct. But we know when we warm it up to 110 degrees, it's good for our taste. I see. So what? Um, so so you reverse engineered how the control panel was talking with the little controller box and like the the temperature sensor and all that. Did you? So was was the temperature sensor working on like a like a like a known protocol that you could just you know tap into with a Raspberry yeah. Pi? How, yeah. how did that work? It was uh, it was working on the one wire protocol. So the one wire protocol is basically it has three wires, uh, two wires for power and then one wire for data, and um, when you when you just install Linux on your Raspberry Pi, like the Raspbian, for example, it has by default support for for the one wire protocol. And when you um, when you connect that wire to the correct GI, uh, G, TPIO port, there's mm -hmm. one specific port for the one wire protocol. Um, in Linux, you can just read a file from a specific device location, and this file will always have like a, a ASCII ASCII text inside. Mm -hmm. um, which represents your current temperature. So whenever you read from that file, it just uh, the, the the Linux will just ask the temperature sensor via the one wire protocol what is the current temperature, and it will write the result in that file. It's not actually a file. It's like I think it's a it's a, it's like a, a virtual file that just contains that data that you just read from from that. So it was very easy to to do that. Oh, that's that's fascinating. So it's all it's like the uh, you access it via like the file system, like you do like GPIO. Yeah, yep, oh, that's really cool. Yep. I'm tr I'm trying to to look to open my Visual Studio, but it's not really helping me here. It looks like you could use your PC to heat your sauna. Yeah, indeed. Uh, actually, I have some some minor issues with my Windows 11 installation. That's like. Sometimes I can click the taskbar, but it's not really doing anything. Let me shut down a few of these uh, Visual Studios. Yeah, sure. Take your take your time. So yeah, the the, the Sauna app is is also built out of uh, different components, um, which I also upgraded to to .NET six. It has an API that also runs on my Synology NAS, um, because the I'm when I use the the app, I'm not communicating with that Raspberry Pi directly. I'm actually communicating with the web API and I'm storing stuff in a database. So um, the idea here is that uh, the, the sauna, it just uses uh, gRPC and it talks to that web API using um, gRPC. Uh, and whenever I make a change in my application, it gets stored in the database and then the, the, the sauna uses the gRPC connection to just s look at things that change. When something changes, uh, the sauna gets notified and he can, he can change like the, the status of the of the relays um, and vice versa when I ask the web API what is the current temperature the web API will use that gRPC channel to talk to the Raspberry Pi and ask the current temperature um, because I also I didn't want to have outside access directly to that Raspberry Pi that's why I go via the web API mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so does so the when you so the code on the Pi is, is that just like a just like a thermostat that just um, you know like thermostat code that just watches that that temperature setting and and just does yep. the relays on and off or is there any type of like um, proportional integral derivative algorithm or just on no. and off? No, um, it's 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 a, yeah it's a very simple algorithm um, that I wrote myself. Um, it's it's really dumb. Um, it is indeed a. It, it's a worker service that I that I run as a Linux daemon. So when the when the Raspberry Pi reboots, the um, the, the Linux daemon uh, uh, starts and it runs my worker service. And it, and then when there's an active session, so it will ask the web API is there is there an active session? It will read the temperature for this active session and it will read the temperature sensor. And if the temperature is below that. Uh, maximum temperature, it will turn on the relay. And when the, the temperature is, is exactly the same or above, it will turn off that relay. And then there's a, there's a little um, thing that I, that I call hysteresis. It's like when it only turns, when, when the temperature is dropping, it only turns on the relay when, when it's like, a, I think, a, a three or four degree difference. So it, it's not mm -hmm. like on one degree, it goes on, off, on, off, on, off. It waits until it, 
it drops th three or four degrees on again. And right. that's it. So it looks like we've got the MySauna my solution open here. Is there anything we wanted to look at uh, specifically? Yeah, but it's stuck. <laughs> it's a feature. Yeah, I wanted to show you that. I would be lying to say yeah, if ahead. I've never been on a live stream where my, my PC decided to start chugging and, and, uh, and uh, you know, drop to like one frame every 10 seconds or whatever. So, um, uh, yeah, totally, totally understand. So yeah, David, uh, our, our, our friend, David, pointed yeah, I'm out very sorry. Is, uh, he wanted to point out this similar to, to what I do on the barbecue. And that's actually why I was asking. Uh, so I've talked about my barbecue on the stream a lot. I, I, I um, uh, hacked my my barbecue smoker and replaced the controller just like you replaced the controller for your sauna um with a very similar setup uh it, where i basically just figured out how to read the existing temperature sensor which in this case was a um a uh, rtd resistive temperature detector i think is what that acronym stands for and um and then i control relays to turn the you know to turn the the auger on and off to feed pellets to the fire uh the difference between mine and yours is your you know your code is basically like you said a thermostat right where it you know waits until you're like three degrees below the set point and then just turns on the relays um for the smoker i i was specifically trying to go for even temperatures so i i implemented something called a proportional integral derivative uh, algorithm that that it is basically like cruise control so you don't overshoot the mark do we still have you johnny okay where did we lose you yeah yeah i'm here i'm here do you hear me yeah 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 there, there's folks there's okay. folks speculating in the chat as to what's what's chewing your cpu up uh uh somebody yeah, pointed out that your cpu uh, is probably throttling it's yeah, it's an. Uh... And watching those temperatures, it seems like the CPU could be in the sauna in sous vide mode <laughs> right now, just heating up slowly. Yeah, I'm back. Um, there was a, a Windows service running, um, like a, a, a telemetric collector thing from Microsoft running at 100%, so I killed it. Oh, sorry. Our bad. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, I think I'm fine now. Yeah, and, and actually, um, yeah. When when I when I look back at at what happened to .NET all in, in all of these years, this this last few years, it's been so easy for me to create these kinds of applications. I can I can run them almost everywhere, and I'm very very happy with that. Um, it's things have, have have changed rapidly in these in these past few years. So yeah, viewers, I'd like to see, I'd like to see oh I'm sorry, go ahead, Scott. I'm I was just gonna point out for the viewers, in case we don't get to all of this, I did drop a link to this GitHub repo for the MySana project. Uh, go ahead and take well, I was just gonna there. say I wanna I wanna see the sensor code. Right. Okay. Because I mean, I I know it's not anything great. It's just like probably read, you know, probably just like uh, yeah. uh, file info dot something. Yeah. But indeed. So I I I have the processor uh, project. This is the, the 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 long running service that continuously watches. Um, I will go into detail uh, in just a few moments. And then I have the sensors project, and the sensors project. Um, yeah. I also I also use Shelly, which is a uh, which are devices where you can um, read the current power usage for for electricity. Mm -hmm. So it's just like an, an an amp thing that you put around your wires, and it, it knows how much amps go, goes through that that wire, and then it translates that into into how many watts of power you're using. So I'm using those, and then I'm using the the, the sauna sensors. Um, and in the sauna sensor, there's uh, get temperature. Um, which will read that temperature from the from a grpc so that's not what i wanted uh, just a moment here nope that's not the one then it's here nope 
So the GPIO service. So this one, it, it's basically you have these GPIO pins on your Raspberry Pi. Um, there's many for you to use. So for the um, for the uh, for the relays, it's very easy. You open a pin and you write a high or a low value to turn it on and turn it off. Um, so basically, those pins they have 3.3 or 5 volts on them. So I bought these small relays. Uh, so I have a double relay. So the Raspberry Pi opens a pin for that 3.3 uh, volts relay. Um, and it writes high or low to turn that relay on or off. And then that relay controls a 220 volts uh, line to the bigger relay. And that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's it. So when I do turn sauna on, I'm just writing a low value to the sauna output GPIO BIO pin, which is a configura configuration value. So I can change the pins by just changing my configuration if I want to. And when I want to turn the sauna off, I uh, write the high value to the same pin. So to double check my, my understanding, so you, you have these relays in the sauna controller that uh, respond to 220 voltage, the, yes. the, you know, flip circuits on and off responding to yes. 220. And yeah. since the Raspberry Pi can't do that, the Raspberry Pi doesn't do 220 AC. It, it, the, the GPIO pins on the Raspberry Pi do you know 3.3 volts or 5 volts DC. Yes. So what you're doing is you're controlling smaller relays to control the bigger relays. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's also much safer, but if you, it's much safer for your Raspberry Pi because when your Raspberry Pi is going to control 220 volts, yeah, you don't want to touch that. Uh, mm -hmm. But you can play around with 3.3 volts. You, you maybe you will feel that, but it, it's not quite dangerous. Um, yeah, I, yeah. So, and maybe somebody in the audience can can help me with this. Is so in Europe? I know the standard is two twenty. Here in the U.S., if you touch two twenty, you're you're hurting bad. Yeah, yeah, is of it like an amper Is it like an amperage difference, or what, what's the deal there? No, 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 no. It it will hurt. It will hurt. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you don't yeah, want yeah, to mess you're around. Correct. With that. If you touch 220 in the U.S., that's an instant perm. Skip the trip to the barber. Your your hair has been done. <laughs> Of course, we, we you have safety stuff. Huh? So when when I touch 20, 220 volts many times, because I'm basically a lazy developer, I'm a lazy guy. Um, so when I'm doing when I'm working on on stuff like uh, like for electricity, I did I did the electricity in my home myself. Um, I wanted to do it good, but I didn't want to turn it off when I when I was working on the other the other end end of the home. And then sometimes you touch it, and then you mm -hmm. have a very short shock, and then the the um, the security will will turn on and it will just turn off all of your power huh because it, there's i don't know what it's called in in um in english but we call it the differential schakelaar probably uh, probably, probably ground, ground fault interrupter yeah something like that and and when it notices something like that it immediately turns off all the power um just flip the switch and so yeah of course it hurts and you will probably feel that for a week in your shoulder um but you're not you're, you're not dying. <laughs> so, so on stage in uh, here in Kansas City, Missouri, U.S., uh, a few weeks ago, I did a talk at the Kansas City Developers Conference, and um, I was dealing with Raspberry Pi and relays, just as you are, and I was controlling a 110 circuit, and I completely forgot that um, that my relay the the relay had a hot 110 connection. I picked up the relay to move it to the other side of the desk and gave myself a 110 shock right on stage. So that was fun. <laughs> nice. Yeah, you were you were also asking how to, how do I re read the temperature? Yeah, it's just reading a file. So it's file read everything from that file. This is a configured uh, configuration thing. So that the, the the file is somewhere in, in etc def. I I don't know by heart um, where that file is. And then I just, yeah, this is pretty ugly code, but it's like the second line and then the substring from 29 with, a, with a, the total uh, until the end of that line. And that contains your decimal temperature value. Cool. Uh, so we're running really short on time here. We've got about okay. one minute remaining. I did, however, want to get to a question that was asked uh, a while back in the chat. So. Say, uh, say I want to become the next Johnny or Cam and be a uh, wizard with IoT and .NET. Where would you point someone to to get started with, you know, Raspberry Pi stuff with .NET? 
Uh, I don't know by heart, but the documentation from Microsoft is where I learned everything from. Um, so they have some documentation regarding uh, IoT and then which kind of devices, because they support, I think, multiple devices. The Raspberry Pi is only one of them. And if I remember correctly, um, yeah, I, I do remember it's correctly. It's docs.microsoft.com slash .net slash IoT. Uh, don't ask me how I know. Okay, and there's there's also the, um, the, the I think the GPIO uh, NuGet package. Mm -hmm. This one. That's the one. I was told there's also a Microsoft Learn module out there. Is that right, Cam? Uh, yeah, we we published a Microsoft Learn module to get you started with .NET IoT. Um, here, I'll throw it in the chat real quick while you start tying up our stream, Scott. Okay. Uh, Johnny, I'll let you speak briefly about the GPIO NuGet package you pulled up here, and then I'll uh, wrap things up. Yeah, so the, the systems of device of GPIO NuGet package is one that is maintained by Microsoft, by the .NET team. Um, or at least it, 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 it sits inside of that um, space on GitHub. It's open source. Um, and it actually supports the GPIO, the GPIO pins. So GPIO stands for Generic uh, Input and Output um, Pins. Uh, and it supports that on multiple devices. And Raspberry Pi is one of them. And the, the methods that I showed you earlier, like the, the, the write a low or high value to a pin or read values from a pin, um, is all part of this, this NuGet package. So that's actually the only thing that you need to do to, to, to put a voltage on a pin or to remove the voltage from the pin. Um, and that's it. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks everyone for tuning into this electrifying episode of the Dotnet <laughs> Doc Show. <laughs> Um, you can check out, as a reminder, our show recordings, upcoming topics, and more at .netdocs.dev. Um, next week, we look forward to talking to our guest, Jesus Ankulu, who will talk about uh, the MVVM pattern as it relates to .NET MAUI. Uh, so if you've you know, been hearing a whole lot about MAUI and want to learn more about what that's all about, tune in next week, and you're sure to learn something. Um, thanks again, everyone, and, and, and uh, I'd like to, again, say thank you to our guest, Johnny, for volunteering the last hour of his day to talk about all this cool .NET stuff with us. Very happy to be here. Until next time, folks. Bye. Bye, Bye guys. <laughs>